I'm going to have a teenager this year. Um, Jackson is our oldest, then Jerry Jr. is our second son, and then our little one, his name is Jude. I told the lady this weekend, Jude is our surprise boy. We still don't know how he got here. <laughs> he slipped in by the skin of his teeth, and so we got Jude. I named him Jude on purpose, because that is as close as I could get to Revelation, because it's finished. It's the end of the line. It's over. So we got Jackson, Jerry Jr., and Jude. We live in a fairly rural part of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and we actually like it that way because we feel like we're worlds away, even though it only takes about 10, 12 minutes or so to get to everything we need in the city. It just feels nice and slow and lazy, kind of sleepy and quiet. We like it. There are, you know, horses over there on somebody's property and cows over there on somebody else's property. And our neighbor directly across the street happens to be one of my closest friends for the past 12 years or so. And she has a pond at the front of her property. We love that so much, and we love living out there. Um, we have, you know, lots of trees, and anytime my boys have the nerve to say to me that they are bored, I say, oh, no, you're not. You see that tree right there? Go play with it. <laughs> you can eat it. You can play tag with it. I don't care what you do with it, but you're not going to be bored out here in the country today, boy. I'm the kind of mama that believes they need to go outside. And so I send them outside. We have those creeks and those trees and bugs and mud and things boys need in their life. And that pond. We love that pond because I will take the, the three boys fishing. We will get the fishing poles that I bought on sale at the local Super Walmart around the corner and the tackle box that I also found on sale there. We have several things in the tackle box, some extra uh, bobbles because we always seem to lose those little bobbers across the water. And we've got extra hooks. We always seem to need extra hooks. I also have some scissors in that tackle box and I also have some gloves because y'all know I don't mind going fishing but I ain't finna touch no fish. <laughs> so we grab all of that stuff and any hot dog meat we have left over from the week that's our bait and we walk across the street to the pond and we fish. We love this one particular corner on the pond because there are some, she some trees that shade this particular corner nicely and because it seems like all the fish seem to gather right there in this little particular cove on the pond. And so we will fish right there. We love fishing right there because when we put the line in the water, within about five minutes, we've got a fish on the line. We take it off, throw it back in, celebrate the catch, and then we put the line back in. Within three to five minutes, we've got a tug and we've got a fish. We catch fish very regularly every time we put that line in. In fact, if we're out there for an hour, we got 10, 12 fish that we've caught before we leave. Instant gratification. This is the kind of fishing a six-year-old needs in his life. We enjoy so much fishing at home that I thought the boys would enjoy fishing as well, just in general, no matter where we were. And so we go to a Christian camp every single summer as a family. They have a lake down by the dining hall. One morning, the boys woke up early. Dining hall wasn't even open for breakfast yet. I said, boys, let's grab our fishing gear that we brought with us. Let's go down to the lake and fish until it's time for breakfast. So we grabbed those same fishing poles, the same tackle box. We walked down to the lake and we fished. And fished. And fished. Not only was, did we not catch anything, there wasn't even a bite on the line. It seemed like all the fish were asleep under the water, and I just became intent and intentional. I wanted to figure out why they weren't responding. I was trying hard to get some response from those fish. Have you ever been doing something for your kids, and then you realize it becomes more about you than the kids? And I got all serious and intentional, and I actually looked up and realized my kids weren't even there on the dock anymore. They had run off to a nearby field. They were throwing the football with each other. I looked over to the yard and I said, boys, I didn't come out here for my health this morning. I came out here for y'all. Get over here and let's fish. One of them yelled back to me and said, mom, I don't like fishing like that. <laughs> the other one yelled over to me, my second son, and he said, yeah, mom, fishing ain't supposed to be that hard. I sat there with the line in the water for just a few more minutes and I thought about what my second son had said. Fishing is not supposed to be that hard. It occurs to me that in a group this size, there are very many of you who this sunny Sunday morning has met you at a time in your life where maybe you would not verbalize those exact same words, 
But honestly, you feel a little bit discouraged because you have been investing your time, your energy, your effort, your experience, your creativity, your ideas. You have been investing in a relationship, in a ministry, in a business, in an organization, and you feel like you've been putting in so much of yourself and getting so little back. And you knew that that fishing trip, when you signed up for it, that marriage or starting that ministry or starting that business or parenting that child, you knew it was going to require some work because all fishing trips do. You just didn't think it was going to be this much work. And you didn't think you would invest this much and yield so few results. And so you're a little bit discouraged because as you as a church have been talking about finishing strong, you've hit these Pockets along the way in your journey where you feel like you've been fishing and fishing, but you haven't been catching anything. There haven't been any benefits that, that in your mind equal to the investment that you have been putting in. It's like when you walk down the aisle and you said, I do, you knew that that assignment, that marriage, that fishing expedition was going to require some work because all fishing expeditions do. But these two years later or five or 10 or 20 years later, you just didn't know it was going to be this much work. Or when you had that baby and you held that sweet, precious thing in your arms those first couple hours. You know that they always so sweet in the first couple hours. <laughs> and you held that baby in your arms, but now these 10 years later, these 16 or 21 or 30 years later, you didn't know it was going to be this much work. Or you said yes to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you told him you would go wherever he leads. You just didn't know he was going to lead you here to do this in this way. You thought that it was going to be, yes, some work, but not this hard. And you certainly didn't think you'd have to give so much of yourself and in exchange be prepared to, to catch so little. And so I want to talk to any of you to get today who are a little bit discouraged because you do want to finish strong. You just feel like along the way you've had some fishing trips that have gone bad, that you've been investing yourself and pulling in so little and you're discouraged and you need some encouragement to continue. There is encouragement for us today. From the story of a man in scripture, and listen, this brother didn't just fish for 30 minutes or 45 or an hour, this brother fished all night long and caught absolutely nothing. His story is found in Luke chapter 5. If you still actually use a Bible with paper pages, turn on over to Luke chapter 5. Or you can use your iPhone, your iPad, any manner of iness. Just get on over to Luke chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay because the person next to you cannot wait for you to lean over and um, look on their device with them. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing in around him, that's Jesus, pressing in around Jesus, and listening to the word of God, Jesus was standing by the lake of Genezareth. The lake of Genezareth is another phrase for the Sea of Galilee. Verse 2 says, and he saw, somebody say he saw. He saw two boats lying by the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and they were washing their nets. Let's just start right here in these two verses, y'all, because we get an opportunity here to see Simon the fisherman exactly the same way Jesus saw him when he approached on this particular day. At this point in the story, Simon has already done his fishing all night long. He is discouraged and disappointed, frustrated, probably irritated. He has gotten out of the boat. He has abandoned that which represents his disappointment and discouragement. And when Jesus shows up, he sees Simon already out of the boat, already washing his net. I love when authors of the scriptures are this descriptive when they want us to know so much juicy detail that they don't leave it out. Because in verse one, he gives us a whole lot of information. He wants us to know that Jesus is surrounded by a crowd of people and he doesn't use the word crowd. He uses the word in the original language that translates to multitude. He wants you to know that there aren't a couple dozen people here or even a couple hundred. Scholars say there were probably thousands upon thousands that were with Jesus that day. And the author goes to great detail to make sure you know that they were not just gathered. They were not calmly, casually, sedately sitting and listening to the word of God like you are this morning. He says that the multitude was pressing in on Jesus. I want you to get the picture here. Jesus is being backed 
up against the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. He has nowhere else to go because the people have pressed him there. These people are a clamoring, chaotic, confusing group of people who are trying their best to, to vie for position, to get as close as they possibly can. They want to be like the woman with the issue of blood who was able to force her way through the crowd enough that she was able to get close enough and reach out and touch the hem of his garment so that power left him and went to her. Do you remember that story? These people wanted to be like, like, that, like that woman. They brought their needs with them. They brought their ailments with them. They brought their friends and their loved ones that are in need of a touch from this miracle worker. Because let me tell you something, even if they weren't yet quite sure about this whole Messiah business, they didn't know about salvation and redemption and all that. What they did know was that when this man showed up, blind people could see. What they knew beyond any reasonable doubt was that when this man showed up, deaf ears could hear, the lame could walk, the dead were raised. And what they knew for sure was that they had heard good teaching before from the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the scripture tells us that when Jesus opened up his mouth, his words were dripping with an awe and an authority they had never, ever heard before. And so wherever Jesus was, a multitude followed because they had never seen a phenomenon like this. And so this crowd is pressing in on Jesus. It is chaotic. It is clamoring. It is confusing. They are screaming at the top of their lungs. They want to get close to Jesus. This is the picture the author is painting. And in the midst of all this confusion and all this chaos with people vying to get close to him. I mean, just think of how you would feel if Jesus were your Bible study teacher. And with all of that chaos and confusion swirling all around, verse two says, Jesus saw one man who'd had a bad night fishing. I have good news for you this morning. It doesn't matter how big the crowd gets. It doesn't matter how big people's church ever becomes. It doesn't matter how many services you have to contain to gather in all of the people who come from the four corners of this city to be a part of this service. It doesn't matter how many other needs are being vocalized to God in prayer. You need to know, know that no matter how big the crowd and no matter how many needs, you serve a God who sees you. That you are not lost in the crowd. That he is fully aware and concerned and, and engaged in the details of your life and mine. We serve a God who's got his eyes on you. And if you're discouraged because you've had a fishing trip gone bad, because you've been investing so much of yourself and you're wondering if anybody sees, if anybody knows, if anybody's aware, if anybody's going to appreciate or applaud or value what it is that you've put in, you need to know that your spouse might not know and your kids might not care and your best friend may not be aware and your parents may not be interested. You need to know that even if nobody in your sphere of influence sees, you serve a God who's got his eyes on you. He knows all about your fishing trip. He knows all about what you've invested and what you've given. He knows about how it hurts your heart that you're seeing so little uh, benefits from this investment that you've been making. You serve a God who sees you. And never in a million years, y'all, should we hear this fact that God sees us. Never should we hear that and it roll off of our shoulders casually as if it's no big deal. God sees us. The God of the universe cares about me. This is God we're talking about. Y'all know he don't need us, right? <laughs> he chooses to be in relationship with us. This is the God of the universe. He's the one that at the appointed hour this morning made sure that the sun was in its place. He's the one that will hold it steadily there until it swaps places with the moon later on this evening. He is the one that will hang every single star in its place who knows every single one of them by name and by number. He is the one that is controlling the throes of the universe that is making sure that galaxies that scientists have not even yet discovered that they are exactly where they need to be and will remain there. He is the one that is making sure while you and I are sitting in this room that the planet that we are on spins, spins on its axis at just the right speed, not too fast, nor too slow that you and I cannot sustain life here. He is the one controlling the throes of the entire universe. And in the midst of all of that, he sees about you. 
He cares about me. So if you're the one who goes to sleep at night, but actually you don't sleep because there are minutes that turn to hours of you fretting and worrying and wondering whether or not you can fix this fishing chip trip problem in your life, your spouse is sound asleep and they don't know. Or if you're the one who has cried so many tears and you're wondering if the tears have gotten lost in the carpet fibers of your bedroom floor, you need to know that every single one of those tears has been captured in the palm of Almighty God. That if you, brother, are the one who's had sweat bubbling up on your brow as you've tried to figure out how you're going to get past this dilemma in your marriage or your finances or on your job, you need to know that your wife might be unaware or that your boys on the job might be unaware, but you need to know your God has seen every single one of those beads of sweat. The moments you've stayed awake, the time you've spent on your knees, not one of those prayers has ricocheted off the ceiling and gone nowhere. Every single one of them have reached the ears of your God. His eyes have seen and his ears have heard and Isaiah 59 says that his arm is not so short that he cannot save and you and I have a God who's got his eye on us but not only that verse 3 takes it one step forward look what verse 3 says it says Jesus got into one of the boats which was Simon's he got into one of the boats not just any boat Simon's boat and then he asked Simon to push out a little way from the land. Jesus then sat down. He began teaching the multitudes on the shore from Simon's boat. Listen to that first line again. Jesus got into one of the boats. The author wants to make sure you know this wasn't just any old regular boat. This was Simon's boat. I will tell you that in my uh, personal just quiet time, that if I'm reading through a passage of scripture and something is repeated in a very short space of time, I know it's not repeated because God likes to hear himself talk. I know it's repeated because I'm supposed to pay attention. Like when you see in the scriptures, truly, truly, I say to you, verily, verily, that's like show enough for real. <laughs> that's what that means. So I pay attention. The same thing is true if there is something that is contrasting in a very short space of time. Something is different than, than it reads somewhere else. That means because I know the Bible is inerrant and I know that it is uh, infallible, that I'm to pay attention to what the nuances there are trying to, to teach me. So when I read in verse 3 that Jesus got into the boat, what's most intriguing to me about that is not that Jesus got in in verse 3. It's that in verse 2, Simon got out. In verse 2, Simon gets out of the boat. In verse 3, Jesus gets into the boat. The very thing that was disappointing and discouraging and irritating enough to Simon in verse 2, that all he wanted to do was get out of it, is the very thing in verse 3 when Jesus is looking for a place to stand to declare his message, he deems fit to plant his feet and turn into a pulpit so that he can proclaim his message to those who were gathered. What does this tell us? It tells us not only that he sees you, it tells us that he will use the part of your life you think is useless. The abandoned boat platform of your experience, the season of your journey that really all you want to do is get out of it and move on and abandon it and go somewhere else with your journey. That empty place is the most likely where Jesus is going to plant his feet in your experience and proclaim his power and his goodness and his glory, not only to you, but to the people who are on the shore of your life. Your sphere of influence, the folks in your job and in your high school classroom and on your university campus and in your neighborhood and in that organization, they're going to see the glory of God because you have emptiness that was filled by a Savior who sees you and loves you. He's going to use the part of your life you think is useless. Be encouraged, my friend. There is nothing beyond the repair of God. There is nothing beyond the use of God. There is no vain, fruitless portion of your journey. We serve a God who can use anything at any time, any way he chooses. He's good like that. <laughs> he uses the part of your journey that you think is useless. My, my mom is a master chef. Actually, she's not really technically a master chef. She's just my mama. And there's no cooking like your mama's cooking. And I don't know about you guys, but I grew up... Um, you know, on Sundays, there was really rarely this going out to eat dinner business. 
On Sunday, mom cooked Sunday dinner, right? It was this whole thing. It was very exciting. I remember her starting sometimes on Saturday night and she would have a roast or something cooking all night long. I remember getting up, I remember smelling it all night long. And then we would get up on Sunday. We hadn't even gone to church yet. We were starving. We wanted whatever she had been making. The yeast rolls would be rising. The macaroni and cheese would be bubbling. I'm making y'all hungry, aren't I? Yeah. It was this huge experience, this Sunday dinner. I loved it so much. And now as a mom with three children, myself and a husband, I know how much work Sunday dinner is. I appreciate my mom so much more. And I still for the life of me can't figure out how she did it because I have one oven. My mom only has one oven, no double ovens. I cannot for the life of me figure out how you get all that food on the table, all hot at the exact same time. Something's gonna be cold at my house because I can't figure it out. I just, I can't do it. So between all the dinner and all the dishes, oh my, I appreciate my mom so much more. And I also know why she didn't cook nothing on Monday or Tuesday. She was tired. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> this is what she would do, though. She would go into the refrigerator and look at the leftovers. A little broccoli, a little macaroni, a little chicken left, onion. She would take all that stuff out. She would chop it all up, reconfigure it, dice it, put it all together. She would probably pour in some cream of mushroom soup, stir that in, sprinkle some cheese on top, because, you know, cheese makes everything all right. <laughs> then she would put it in, into the oven, at 350 and she would sit there at 350 waiting for the exact right moment when it was all bubbly and perfect she would pull it out of the oven then she would give it this french sounding name and set it on the table in front of us <laughs> we thought it was this brand new masterpiece but it wasn't something brand new it was just leftovers in the hands of a master Okay, let me tell you what God is going to do with the useless portions of your journey and of your life and mine. What he's going to do is take a good peek at all of that, and then he's going to pull it out. He's going to chop it up, reconfigure it. He's going to rearrange it. Then he's going to pour the cream of Holy Ghost on top of that thing, stir it in, sprinkle on some grace and mercy, because you know grace and mercy makes everything better. Then yes, he's going to put you in the oven of fire and trial. And he will leave you there for just the right amount of time. Like any good master chef, he's going to pull you out before it's too much. And then, y'all, then he's going, the best part is he gives you a brand new name. He stamps you with himself. And then he sets you down in front of a lost and dying world that needs to know our God is mm, mm, good. That's what he does. It's his best work, his finest work, is when he takes our messes and makes a message out of them. It's his greatest work upon us to take what we think is useless and to show us how useful it can be. So here's Simon with all of this emptiness, this empty platform, no fish in sight, but it is turned into a pulpit from which Jesus proclaims the message that he had there. Can I tell you that the people on your job and the people in your neighborhood, high school student, the, the folks in your class, they do not need to hear us talk about how good Jesus is. What they need is to see somebody who had some emptiness and Jesus filled it. They need to see a marriage that was hanging on by a thread, but now the two of you are not still just married, you are happily married. And it is a testament to emptiness that he filled. The world needs to see somebody who was lost and now they're found, blind, but now they see. And when they see the message of Christ being proclaimed through our experience, that is when they wanna know about this God we serve. And this is how he does it. He uses the empty platforms of our experience, the tough portions of our journey, where we feel like we're not yielding any fruit. He uses that as an opportunity, as margin in your life to step in and make his presence known and put his power on display through your life. I believe that God is sovereign. Somebody say sovereign. Sovereign. Do you believe that? Okay, about four of you. Okay, let me tell you what sovereignty is. Sovereignty means that our God uh, existed before time began, eternity passed. Genesis 1-1 is not the beginning for, for God. The only reason why there was a Genesis 1-1 is because God already existed so that he could say, let there be and there was. God has been in eternity past. He has seen all of time from the beginning, Genesis 1-1, all the way to the end of the spectrum of time, which you and I have not yet seen. 
But he has not just stopped there. Our God has also already seen into eternity future. So he has seen all of the spectrum from eternity past through time and history into eternity future. But sovereignty does not just mean he's seen it. Sovereignty means he's got the whole thing in the palm of his hand. Sovereignty is what allows you and I to do what Psalm 4610 says. Be still. Cease striving. Chill out. And know that I am God. Sovereignty means that last week that thing that happened to you surprised you but God was not in the heavens going oops that one slipped past me mm -mm. <laughs> nope he's sovereign he's already been there and done that sovereignty means he's got your back okay you believe he's sovereign it's still only like 10 of y'all do you believe he's sovereign yeah. all, right. all right so we're going to apply his sovereignty to Luke chapter 5 okay God already knows Simon is out in the deep water all night long fishing. This is an experienced fisherman, y'all. This is what he does. He fishes on the Sea of Galilee. He always catches fish. But this night, he casts out his net, brings it in. Shocked. No fish? He casts it out again, brings it in. Disappointed, discouraged, shocked. No fish? Now the midnight hour is coming, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. It's the bleakest time of night. He's becoming more and more frustrated and discouraged and disappointed every time he pulls in that net and there are no fish because he could not in his humanity know what Jesus in his sovereignty would have been aware of. What Jesus would have known was that there was a morning coming. And Jesus would have known that in the morning there were going to be a multitude of people gathered and they were going to need to hear his message. He knew he was going to need to try to find a place to stand to make sure that his voice would be amplified in such a way that everybody from the very front row of that group all the way to the furthest reaches of that group would not miss one word that was going to come out of his mouth. And so Jesus knew, listen, that if he allowed Simon to catch all his own fish, the platform of that boat would have been so filled with a bunch of flipping, flopping fish, there would be no room for his feet. So in his sovereignty, he allowed Simon to fish and catch nothing so that there would be margin for Jesus to stand. You may be in your life right now in a position where no matter what you do, you're not going to catch fish. And this is a hard part of this message because I don't know about y'all, but when I fish, I like to catch something. If I'm going to devote my time or my energy, my effort to a circumstance, if I'm going to pour that in, I want the benefits from all this that I'm investing. Amen? But sometimes God will purposefully, specifically, strategically put you in a position where no matter what your skill is, no matter how talented you are, no matter the diplomas on your wall, no matter how much money you have, no matter how many connections you have made, no matter who you are or what you've done, no matter how hard you fish, you're not going to catch anything. Because if you and I can always catch our own fish, we will work ourselves out of an opportunity to see what it's like for his feet to be in our lives. So listen, if you're discouraged today because you've got some emptiness, don't let that discourage you. You ought to look up in holy anticipation because if he's allowed the emptiness, that means he intends to fill it. He's going to use the part of your life you think is useless. He's going to make something out of that emptiness. He's going to use it as a, he's going to turn that empty platform into a pulpit where he's going to declare his glory. So... As far as we can tell, Simon's the only person on the boat with him. He sits in shallow, shallow water in the boat with Jesus while Jesus is speaking to the crowd. But then Jesus turns to Simon after he finished speaking to the crowd, finished preaching the message. He turns to Simon in verse 4 and he says, Push out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Push out into deep water. I like shallow water. You see, in shallow water, I can stand up on my own two feet. Deep water is when I'm in over my head. Jesus says, Simon, let's go deep. Simon had a front row seat for that message. Everybody else was on the shore. Simon was in the boat sitting right there looking right up at Jesus while Jesus was speaking to the crowd. 
Jesus turns to him after hearing the Sunday message and says, let's see if it worked. Let me tell you the point of church, the point of you gathering on this Sunday is not so that you and I can sit together and applaud the message and say amen to the message and then go outside and not be willing to go deep when God calls us to it. We have wasted our time and energy if Sunday after Sunday, Pastor Herbert stands and he teaches you and I the truth from Scripture and yet we go out and live not in response to what it is that we've heard. The beauty of the church is that what we hear when we have a front row seat to the teaching of Jesus, that when the Holy Spirit whispers to our heart on Monday, let's go deep. We say, yes, sir, because I believe what I heard in church on Monday. Y'all, this is like a huddle, a huddle in a football game. We, when we go to football games, you know, you don't mind the huddle. You appreciate that the team is huddling. But if they huddle for three hours, you're going to have a problem with that. Because we didn't pay all that money per ticket to watch 11 men in tights bending over huddling. That's not what we came for. What we came for is to see the difference that the huddle is going to make on the field to play. Well, y'all, this is the huddle. This is easy up in here. We can wave our hands. We can applaud. We can celebrate. We can fellowship with one another. Enjoy the huddle. But at some point here in a few minutes, we're going to break huddle. And we're supposed to leave these doors and score touchdowns for the kingdom of God because we've huddled. So I'm telling you right now, I'm, I'm telling you right now that the reason why the Lord allowed me the privilege to be here from Dallas today, the reason why you came on this Sunday morning, I know some of you this morning were like, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to church. And yet somehow you came to church. And let me tell you the reason why. Because he wants you to know right now that in the days and weeks coming up, the Holy Spirit's going to whisper to you, trust me, come to deep water. And he wants you to know right now that if you will trust him and come to deep water, you are setting yourself up for something spectacular. Because look what happens in Simon's experience. Simon answers and he says to him, Master, we've worked hard all night long. We've caught nothing. We've already tried this, Jesus. But at your bidding, I'll go anyway. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. And so Peter, Simon Peter, signaled to his partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came, they filled both the boats, and both of them began to sink. Y'all, that's a lot of fish. The waters that had been completely fruitful, unfruitful, completely unproductive the night before, all of a sudden now the waters are just teeming with fish. There are fish everywhere, almost as, as if the fish could not wait but to get in the boat. In fact, you know that Jesus could have said, fish, get in the boat. And you know fish would have just started jumping into the boat, just jumping into the boat. This is the same God who said to the winds and the waves, peace be still. And they obeyed. So he could have done it, but he didn't do that. He said, mm -mm, Simon, you come to deep water with me. You cast out your net. In other words, he allows us to act in faith in order to be a participant in the receiving his miracles and promises in our life. Do you know that there are over 8,000 promises written in the scripture for daughters and sons of God? Promises in the scripture are basically opportunities for us to experience God. There are over 8,000 of them in the scriptures. Do you know that most of those he did not put in our hand? He put them in our reach. In other words, we have to do our part in order to grab hold of his part. And so, yeah, he's going to call you to deep water. Then he's going to ask you to trust him. Cast out your net in that empty place where you already feel like there's no hope. Why would I do this again? Well, you do it again because it's different. This time Jesus is in the boat with you. So fish were coming out of everywhere. So many fish. That verse 7 says, Simon signaled to his partners. <laughs> it, it's specific to tell us that he signaled, wants us to know he didn't call out to them. If it would have been me, think about it. I would, wouldn't we have called out? Hey, y'all, get over here. You are not going to believe this. That's not what he did. He signaled. The scripture does not tell us why, but I wonder if the author has gone to so much length to make sure we know how Simon called them. I wonder if the reason why he signaled and didn't speak is because he was speechless. 
y'all, when his brain tried to come up with the right words to describe what he was seeing happening in front of him, his brain couldn't even come up with the right vernacular. So the best he could come up with was, I want to ask you, when's the last time God stunned you speechless? And I want to suggest to you that as you think about finishing strong in your life, every single time you and I come across a season or a pocket in our marriage or in our parenting or in our job or in these relationships that we have with others, the, when we come across these empty places where we're fishing and catching nothing, I want to suggest to you that the purpose is because he's setting you up to stun you speechless. That he's putting you in a right position so that you can know what it's like to have the feet of Jesus invade your circumstances and then to follow him by faith and see what it is like when in obedience he responds to you and reveals to you and shows you and uh, allows you to be a beholder of his miracles in your life. And I think the reason why we're here on this Sunday morning is because he wants you to know right now that if you'll come deep, if I'll come deep when he calls us, We'll get to see Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond, like lots of fish, anything you can ask or even think, to that great God be the glory. In the church, that's us, and in Christ Jesus, both now and forever, somebody ought to say amen.